conversation um, or to feel attacked in any way, but simply to provide hope uh, that there's a better way and that uh, it's important for us to acknowledge the way that our actions and behaviors affect other people in the world. Um, so we have Haley here tonight, Haley Hobson, uh, from the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, and she's actually the Vice President of Advocacy and Outreach there. She's been for about two and a half years now. So she's with us tonight from Washington, D.C. Uh, to tell us more about the subject. So we'll invite her up. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you all for coming out. I know it's a weeknight, and it's in that time of the semester where papers start getting due, so I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to come here and to talk about this issue that's really important and is really underrepresented. People don't really talk about it, and as has already been said, talking about the links between pornography and sex trafficking. As has already been mentioned, I'm from the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, which is a nonprofit out in Washington, D.C. And our mission is to defend human dignity and oppose all forms of sexual exploitation. And we really focus on addressing the intersectionality between these different forms of sexual exploitation. Because there's no way that we can begin to disentangle the web of sexual exploitation until we start to see the ways that child sexual exploitation um, pornography, violence against women, sex trafficking, these things don't occur in a vacuum, but they actually often overlap and reinforce one another. And so today you'll see that theme happen again and again as we're discussing sex trafficking and pornography. I think everybody has a pretty good understanding of what sex trafficking is. According to federal law, sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provisioning, patronizing, soliciting, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act through force, fraud, and coercion. Those are the three defining factors. But I would also add to this definition that under federal law, any person who is engaged in selling sex who's under the age of 18 is by definition also a sex trafficking victim. I bring this up because a lot of the times in the media we'll see headlines that say teenage prostitute or I just heard today that Netflix is actually going to bought the rights to a new show about a teenage prostitute. But there's no such thing as a teenage prostitute. Anyone under 18 who's selling sex is a sex trafficking victim. People also really want to know numbers about sex trafficking. Is it a really big problem? Um, Unfortunately, sex trafficking is a crime that's hidden in the shadows. It's difficult to find good research on the numbers of individuals in America who are sex trafficked today. Uh, so I have a few numbers for you, but there's, it's certainly not a total number. Um, potential human trafficking victims are around 7,000 that were reported to task forces between 2008 to 2014, but these task forces only covered about 19% of the country. There were over 5,000 potential cases of human trafficking that came in on the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline number, but those are only the cases that were called in to that specific phone number. And between 3,000 to 8,000 female uh, victims of sex trafficking were found in San Diego County in 2015, but that's only one county amongst countless. Um, even in states like North Dakota, this is a huge problem, sex trafficking. I've talked with so many people who've mentioned the issue with the oil boom, how that really sent a skyrocket of sex trafficking in the area. But even today, it's still going on. There are websites like Backpage.com where people can go to easily buy and sell other human beings for sex. And just this week, I went on there and typed in Fargo and saw people who are being bought and sold in this area this very week. So this is something that's not only a national problem, but it's true for every community that it's happening in our communities. So everyone kind of understands sex trafficking is bad. It's obviously harmful. It's obviously a crime. But how are sex trafficking and pornography linked? So that's what I'm going to really be focusing on today. Um, we can talk about the ways that they're linked in four categories. That pornography increases the demand for sex trafficking. Pornography is often used to train victims of sex trafficking. 
that victims are made to produce pornography, and that there's even trafficking in the pornography industry or trafficking for the purpose of pornography as well. The issue of demand is what I'll honestly spend most of my time on tonight because it's the most complicated web and it's also the most important. At the end of the day, if well, some women will buy sex also, but it's predominantly a male-driven industry, and if men stopped buying sex today, sex trafficking would disappear. So when I'm talking about the demand, that's what I'm addressing. To end sex trafficking, we need to end the demand. And it's also important to recognize that pornography today is not the pornography of my grandparents' generation. It's no longer Playboy that's hidden under the bed cushions. It's Internet pornography is piped into the lives of young men and increasingly young women, often without really their consent, and that's having detrimental impacts on a global scale. Dr. Gail Dines is an excellent feminist researcher who's written extensively on this issue. She said it best. She said that we are in the midst of a massive social experiment, one that is reshaping the lives of young people all over the globe. Never before have children and youth had complete access to hardcore pornography that is based on degradation, debasement, and the humiliation of women. We see in our society today that our genera no generation in the past has had access to high-speed internet pornography with endless amounts of novelty ever before. The human race has never dealt with this variable before. And so it's important that we're recognizing that and that we're willing to start looking at the research on how this could be impacting us. So scaling it back, how does pornography impact the brain? We need to understand neuro neurology, behavioral addiction, these things can get complicated, but I think it's helpful to remember two key points, and that is that the brain is conditionable and it's susceptible to chasing addictive spikes of dopamine. Your brain actually changes. This is something that we see um, is well established in, this, in science. There was one study that was published in 1995 um, that showed that the part of the brain that controls your hand functions actually grows if you're a violin player as compared to someone who doesn't play a violin. And it's more pronounced if you start playing the violin at a younger age, that part of your brain that controls fine motor functions grows more than someone who maybe started playing the violin later on in life. We see this replicated in other areas as well. Taxi drivers have increased regions of their brain for locational um, spatial recognition, and we see that also with jugglers. And one study, this is applicable for college students, you'll be happy to know, one study that looked at medical students a few months before and after a test found that the regions in their brain for cognitive learning actually physically grew um, before their big test date as they were cramming information in. So we, so we know that what we do and what we learn shapes our brain, but the problem is, is that while different forms of learning grow our brain, pornography has been found to actually shrink regions of our brain. One 2014 study found that increased pornography use is linked to decreased brain matter, physical brain matter, in the regions of the brain associated with motivation and decision making. And that also con um, contributed to impaired impulse control, desensitization to sexual reward, and the shrinkage was more pronounced in the heaviest users. So this harkens back to what we know about violin players. The earlier that you're using it, the more you're using it, the more it impacts the structure of your brain. We also see that people who are using pornography are susceptible to escalation. There was a 2015 MRI study out of Cambridge that found that compulsive sexual behavior, like watching pornography, is characterized by novelty seeking, uh, conditioning, habituation to sexual stimuli. And this just means that for many users, they need more extreme content over time in order to achieve the same level of arousal. This follows what we understand for most addictions, with drug addiction, you might need a larger dose um, in order to achieve the same high as before. But with pornography, you maybe need new material, you need shocking material. And I see this kind of stuff played out all the time from the testimonies of young men who come and talk to me about their pornography use. Uh, maybe as a child, they were first extremely excited by pictures of women in bikinis, and then they went to videos of vanilla pornography, and then they got into more extreme material over time because they needed something new. 
Why does this happen? Same as with any kind of other addiction, you're chasing that dopamine high. When we're having any kind of sexual experience, our brain doesn't know the difference between a real person or the screen. So we're getting those same spikes of dopamine um, and it's stimulated by novelty, which is again why internet pornography is just this completely new variable that we're having to deal with because we can see more nude images, nude videos, more sexual partners is the way that our brain is perceiving it in a 10 minute pornography binge than our ancestors used to be able to see in their entire lifespans. And as a caveat, as I'm talking about this, certainly not everybody who watches pornography becomes addicted. Not everybody who watches pornography goes on to um, engage in the kind of material that I'm about to begin discussing, but it is a serious problem because many who do watch it do escalate to these things. So we see that pornography is shaping our brain. It can escalate you into more extreme and deviant material. And for some people, it can also escalate into actions in the real world because watching something on the screen is no longer giving them that high and they need to then go on and act out in, in real life what they're watching. And that's how we see that pornography is linked to sexual violence. Pornography actually shapes the user's sexual template around themes of degradation, unclear consent, and sexual violence. And how does it do that? It does that through something called cognitive script theory, which is a really interesting um, idea. And it's the idea that media provides a heuristic learning model. Basically that what we watch, it tells us what should or should not be happening in a certain situation, how people will respond to how we're acting, and what the ultimate outcome of that should be. This is not a very complicated concept. When I was a kid, I watched a TV show called Recess. I don't know if anyone else here ever heard of this. I'm seeing some nods. It was this show about these bratty middle schoolers who just, um, you know, they railed against the authority and they were really disrespectful to adults. And I would watch this and I would start acting like the kids on the show because I thought that that's how kids should act, that people would think it's funny, and that ultimately it would just be a big laugh. So you can see it in a really clear way with how kids respond to what they're watching. But with pornography, it's actually even more serious of an issue because we have a neurochemical reinforcement because there's sexual activity, masturbation, and orgasm that's happening when we're watching pornography. You don't look at pornography like it's a painting. You are engaging with it, and um, those, that neurochemical reinforcement really makes this script theory so much more potent because it's cementing those themes into your brain. Why is that significant? because the messages that pornography is telling you are messages that women enjoy sexual violence. One study looked at internet, popular internet pornography and found that 88% of the scenes contained physical and, or sexual violence against women, and that 95% of the time, the women responded either neutrally or with pleasure. What kind of message is that sending to us? How many times in college do people sit us down to talk about the importance of consent, the importance of having a loving relationship, recognizing that no means no, but you know, a 30 minute conversation over lunch is not going to change the same messages that we're piping into our brains and cementing with sexual experiences on a, a daily or weekly or monthly basis. And these lessons are unfortunately being learned. We had one young boy write in who was 14 years old talking about the kinds of material that he was seeing, including defecation, animals, torturing and raping women. He said that I have seen it all and so have a lot of my friends. He said, we started off right away with hardcore. It, it's always there right in your face when you go to these download sites on the internet. Pornography is teaching young men that this is what real men want, that this is what masculinity is about, the average 14-year-old does not type in that kind of material into the internet. That's not what he's first starting out looking for. You're not, you don't come out of the womb thinking that torturing another person is sexually arousing. That is a learned behavior. Typically, young boys, if they are searching out pornography at all, 
might type it in and expect to see a nude image, and what they find is something that the pornography industry, which is an industry, um, has created to push these kinds of more extreme materials on them. You know, I knew a young boy who, when he was eight years old, he was just playing a video game, and a pop-up of a graphic rape pornography scene showed up on his computer. And this descended into a 10-year pornography addiction that he really struggled with. And it took him 10 years to stop watching this. But I look at that young boy or boys like Jason, this 14-year-old, and think, what kind of choice did they have in this matter? Really, we need to recognize that young boys and then men who are growing up with this material are in some ways also victims of the pornography industry that is going after them and getting them hooked on this degrading material. And so we see that these kinds of themes that are so prevalent in pornography for some people go on to impact their actions. We see that a meta-analysis, which is one of the strongest forms of research that you can have, of 46 different studies reported that the effects of exposure to pornographic material are clear and consistent across all 46 studies. They put people at increased risks for committing sexual offenses and for accepting rape myths. Rape myths include a variety of permission-giving beliefs around sexual assault, ideas that a man can't rape his wife, that um, women owe something to a man if they spend money on them in a date, that a woman enjoys rape, that she should be raped if she's wearing certain amounts of um, certain kinds of clothing, that no really means yes. I think we see, even just in our media right now, with the Me Too campaign, Harvey Weinstein, all of this, the detrimental effects when more people start to believe these kinds of messages about women or about sexuality in general. And we see those things not only in our news, in our headlines right now, but even headlines in the past. Elizabeth Smart is un unfortunately a famous individual because she was kidnapped from her home when she was a very young girl. She was missing for several months. It was a national hunt to find her, and she was kept by a man who sexually abused her. And she told Fight the New Drug, I can't say that he would not have gone out and kidnapped me had he not looked at pornography. She said, all I know is that pornography made my living hell worse. We hear from people on almost a weekly basis who write to us to talk about the ways that their child sexual abuse or their sexual abuse by an intimate partner or by a stranger, in the case of Elizabeth Smart, was escalated in intensity or deviancy or frequency by their abuser's use of pornography. Elizabeth explained that her abuser would even watch pornography and then literally act out what he had just watched on her, a young, young girl. So we're seeing this happen in real life testimonies. And the research, again, it's backing it up. A 2015, another meta-analysis from 22 studies looking at seven different countries found that internationally, the consumption of pornography was linked with increased physical and verbal aggression among, among males and females alike. And Again, this kind of goes back to cognitive script theory. It's what we're watching, and then it's what some people go on to act out. And while not everyone who watches pornography will act out in this way, everyone who watches pornography knows how to act out in this way. You know, I can do this, which is a very strange hand motion. Why would you ever want to do this? Probably none, no one has ever seen this before in their life. But simply by watching me do this, you all now know how. And that's the way that it works with pornography. Even if a person would maybe not ever think that they would go out and do this, they know how to better abuse or exploit someone else through watching that material. And so we see that pornography culture is actually feeding rape culture. This is particularly um, important for colleges to understand. Surveyed college fraternity men who used mainstream pornography reported a greater intent to commit rape if they knew that they wouldn't get caught. This research also found that these fraternity men um, were less likely to intervene as a bystander if they saw one of their friends sexually assaulting another person if they had been watching pornography regularly. And th these people weren't just watching the really extreme, dirty, obviously gross 
pornography that you know everyone would agree is is too violent. This was a common finding across all genres of pornography, from the vanilla to the extreme. It's a change in attitude towards rape, and it remains consistent across all genres. Um, and they're more likely to believe in rape myths. That's a regular, regular theme that we're seeing. But, I mean, not to make men the enemy, right? Pornography is lying. It's saying that women are tools to be used, but it's also telling us that men are inevitable predators that could never be, you know, capable of holding back from assaulting another person, which is just such a blatant lie and honestly really offensive. And it's a reason that I think young men especially should be outraged that the pornography industry is piping this kind of material into young boys' minds at such a young age because it's a complete lie about the um, sexual integrity of any person. One young boy who's 20 years old wrote to us and said, I gradually became desensitized and escalated to more extreme, brutal, and degrading videos. He said that this hurts me even more because I am a sensitive and empathetic person and would never want anyone to suffer, especially not girls or young women in real life. He said that it is devastating and cruel to see how you get accustomed to practices that you would naturally find disgusting or inhumane. And so we see that when we have pornography that is literally restructuring our brains, it can have an escalating impact where some individuals who are watching it go on and want to act out what they're seeing. This leads to increases in rates of sexual violence. And it also then fuels the demand for commercial sexual exploitation. Because some people will go on to act out in sexual violence on another person, and some will go on to buy another person so that they can act out sexually against them in a controlled manner. So we see that pornography is fueling the demand for sexual exploitation. Um, there was an analysis of 101 sex buyers that found that sex buyers use pornography more frequently than those, those who do not buy sex, and that they reported that their sexual preferences changed so that they sought more violent or risky forms of sex. That part's not surprising to us. We know that there's this escalating pattern. Um, a Swedish study found that 18-year-old males were, who were frequent users of pornography were significantly more likely to go out and buy sex than boys of the same age who were not regularly using pornography. Why does this happen? Because sexual fantasy is actually rehearsal for our relationships. If you imagine others um, as instruments of, for your own gratification, you're rehearsing these attitudes and cementing those with your sexual experiences as well. So the more that you picture yourself using another person or being used, the more that those encounters feel normal, uh, feel familiar. And I think in some ways that's also a reason why we have a kind of callousness in our culture towards issues like sexual assault, sexual harassment, where people want to downplay it and say, oh, well, it's not that bad, because these theme themes are normalized in, in pornography and then increasingly in our mainstream entertainment as well. In addition to the ways that pornography fuels the demand for sex trafficking, we see that victims of sex trafficking are often being trained with pornography. The Protection Project um, journal noted that pimps and sex traffickers use pornography to initiate their victims into their new life of sexual slavery so that they can get hardened to accept the inevitable and learn what is expected of them. And we have an another uh, statement here. It says that traffickers are using pornography to train the children that they steal, take, or recruit. They're forcing these young girls and young boys to watch pornography to train child sexual abuse in general, whether that's commercially commodified or just in one individual. Um, often child abusers will show pornography to a young child in the grooming process to get them accustomed to the idea that this is something that adults do, this is something that you will, I, I will engage in, and so this is something that we see both with child se sexual abuse and with sex trafficking. One survivor of sex trafficking wrote in and said that sometimes guys would be, bring pornography and insist that we turn it on and watch it together. Then they would demand that I copy what the girls in the movies were doing. She said that once she screamed, he injured her. He said he beat me, telling me to shut up, but I couldn't keep going. He left me there bleeding. A lady in the motel took me to the hospital where I had to get 12 stitches. 
I unfortunately know so many more testimonies very similar to this that are even more graphic and even more disturbing and that show the ways that sex buyers are often bringing pornography into their experiences to, as a menu that they want to order from. In addition to that, we see that sex traffickers are producing pornography of sex trafficking victims. I don't want to say that traffickers are smart, but they're not dumb. They understand that you can sell one woman so many times before her body starts to break down and she can't physically handle it anymore. But if you make that woman into a video, you can sell that video over and over and over and over again. And so they use it to diversify their profits and also to advertise their victims for prostitution. I mentioned Backpage.com. I'm going to mention that maybe a few times tonight. Um, on Backpage.com, there will often be pornographic images alongside the ads in order to help advertise so that people know what they're getting. I know of one young woman who was literally sex trafficked into pornography, who was told that she was going to get a modeling job in California, so she flew down, met this guy at his house, he stole her passport, locked her in, kept her there, abused her, and then made her create pornography for him on a regular basis. So that does happen, but we also see that men and women are being exploited in the production of pornography itself, even when it doesn't rise to the level of sex trafficking. And, um, and if, if, but, but there is trafficking in, in pornography. Again, this is just noting that if a person is forced into pornography, that is a form of sex trafficking. Um, there are, are also issues like live webcam videos, um, or sometimes rape cam web, webcams from countries like Cambodia, but also increasingly within America itself, where there's pay-per-view, people will send in requests while they watch the rape of a woman, of a sex trafficking victim online. And pornography is becoming this way for so many people, for instead of one person to be trafficking an individual, now thousands or even millions are becoming vicarious participants in this person's trafficking. And so I think it's also important to just recognize what is pornography in general? Pornography is prostitution for mass consumption. Whether or not it's trafficking or there's some level of consent that's going on there, pornography is just a medium that's portraying a prostituted act that's allowing more people to engage in that same prostituted act, to have sexual stimulation and gratification from that. And so, as, as I was mentioning, not only are people sex trafficked, but they're also just exploited in the production of mainstream pornography, even where the girls are signing contracts. I regularly hear from pornography performers who talk about the ways that, yes, they signed a contract and they wrote down the list of acts that they did not want to do, and they immediately were pressured into doing those very acts that they did not want to do. One male performer from a mainstream pornography website wrote that if the women were completely sober, no alcohol, no drugs, I guarantee you that most of them would probably have mental breakdowns. In the mainstream pornography industry in California, the women who are involved in pornography have much higher rates of depression than women in the general population. They're more likely to have lived in poverty, so they're engaging in pornography, hoping that that will get them out of poverty. But most of them continue to live in poverty even after their time in pornography. Not a lot of women are getting rich from this. Most women are used up within about three months, and then they're out of the industry with PTSD, with sometimes physical, or mental, or emotional scars, and no net financial gain. And these women are also typically victims of past sexual abuse. What kind of industry is this? where this is the demographic that they're relying on to recruit from. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, pornography, it's not that bad, but I think that we can at least agree that no man should have the right to sexually buy access to a woman, and no woman should have a right to sex buy sexual access to another man. That in itself it becomes a form of coercion when you're 
counting on someone to struggle with a form of mental illness and poverty and past child and past sexual abuse for you to then come in and take advantage of them. That in, in and of itself is exploitive. So what can we do? <laughs> this is a very depressing topic. It's honestly overwhelming. Um, I could share countless more testimonies with you, but the good news is that, is that there actually is a lot that we can do as individuals and as citizens our organization, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, tries to give people a chance to make a change themselves. So I'll talk about a few different ways that we do that. One is through our Dirty Dozen list, dirtydozenlist.com, where we name 12 mainstream contributors to sexual exploitation. Um, so for example, HBO is on this list because of their mainstream entertainment, like Game of Thrones and The Deuce, which is a new TV show that's all about pornography and prostitution, and it features gratuitous sexual violence against women, which is just further normalizing these themes in our society. But then there's also companies like Comcast that are on, that's on that list, because Comcast sells on-demand pornography. And so in that way, they're really feeding into this culture of sexual exploitation. They're not only adding to the profits of the pornography industry, they're, increase, they're adding to the escalation factor to the demand for sex trafficking by piping pornography into more people's lives. What the Dirty Dozen list does is it lets us take direct, tangible action against these bad corporate actors. Through the Dirty Dozen list, you can email CEOs, you can tweet at producers, and really make your voice heard. And this actually has led to some incredible progress in the past. In the past year, we got four major hotel chains, Hilton, Hyatt, Intercontinental Hotels Group, and Starwood, to agree to stop selling on-demand pornography in their hotel rooms globally. This is affecting two million hotel rooms around the world that are no longer conduits for pornography. We also got Google to stop linking ads to pornographic content. And we got the Department of Defense to stop selling pornography on Army and Air Force bases. We talk about military sexual assault, but then the military is literally selling pornography, which is normalizing these exact same themes. So this list has led to some tremendous and incredible victories, and it's all because of people taking action. Hil um, a Hilton executive called us and told us, we're getting 1,000 emails a week because of your list. How do we get it to stop? We said, stop selling pornography. And they did, which is so liberating and encouraging that individuals do have a voice still against these big companies. We also have an educational resource in StopTraffickingDemand.com, which goes over a lot of the information that I'm talking about today, the links between pornography and sex trafficking. There are more testimonials on there from um, survivors, so if that's something that you're interested in learning more about, Stop Trafficking Demand. And then when it comes to legislation, there's a lot that we can do, and it's actually a very urgent and timely issue. There's le current legislation, both in the Senate and in the House, to amend an outdated law that currently makes it impossible to stop websites that are used for sex trafficking. So I mentioned Backpage.com. Backpage.com is a sex trafficking website. At least 88% of their profits come from their ads for sex. 51 state attorneys generals have signed a letter saying we know that child sex trafficking is happening on this website and we want Congress to take action. Um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is the center that you call in to give tips if you, if you think that you've seen an exploited child, says that about a third to two thirds of their calls come from ads on Backpage.com where people are seeing children being bought and sold on this website. The CEO of Backpage.com was called to testify in a hearing before, before Congress in an investigative hearing that was trying to figure out why so much sex trafficking was happening on this website. The CEO didn't show up. The Congress had to subpoena him and force him to come in, which was an extreme thing for them to have to do for this kind of hearing. And the CEO pled the fifth on every single question and refused to answer anything. Backpage is a sex trafficking website, but because of an outdated law called the Communications Decency Act, which was passed in 1996, before the internet was really a thing, th that law says that any website that has third-party posts 
should be immune from any liability for those third-party posts. This makes sense in some cases, right? Facebook should not be held liable for hate speech because we can be mean to each other in the comments section. That's not Facebook's problem. But with Backpage, we see clear either reckless disregard or knowing facilitation of sex trafficking. And, but because of that law, it's impossible for sex trafficking victims to sue this website or for Congress to really take effective action against this website. So, as I said, right now there's a bill in both the House and the Senate where they're trying to amend this law, but the tech community is fighting it really hard. Google is on Capitol Hill lobbying against amending this bill. The Electronic Found Frontier Foundation, um, Tech Freedom, all of these groups that they're afraid of any potential future liability, like maybe there will be a frivolous lawsuit in the future, but they're concerned about the potential of a frivolous lawsuit when we know that there are for facts individuals being bought and sold on Backpage right now in this state and across this country, and they are being sexually assaulted right now. But Google wants us to care about the potential for frivolous lawsuits more than those thousands of lives. So you can take action by calling your elected representatives in the House and in the Senate, ask them to amend the Communications Decency Act to support um, those bills. There's more information about that on this website and sexualexploitation.org slash CDA. But this is the single most important legislation regarding sex trafficking that my generation will ever see. If this law is not amended, sex trafficking is basically free game on the internet because websites can't be held accountable unless we amend this law. So this is a very important action that we can all do today, this week. Please email your senators and representatives, post on their Facebook walls, tweet at them, um, let them know that you want them to amend the Communications Decency Act. You can also share resources. Pornography addiction is a real thing, and we need to have a lot of empathy for people who are struggling with pornography, who don't want to be watching it. We have a long list of resources on this website and sexualexploitation.org slash resources. Uh, software like Covenant Eyes, which maybe we'll talk about more later. Covenant Eyes is an amazing software for accountability and for filtering. Um, and, and other programs for recovering from the addiction. But we also have resources for parents about how to protect their kids, how to talk to their kids about this, and also for spouses uh, or girlfriends or dating partners of people who are struggling with pornography because that also brings a whole new dynamic of distrust and discord into relationships as well. So this is a great website to check out. Also, if any of you guys are gonna be in Washington, D.C. in the spring, please come to our summit. Um, this is an amazing three-day summit that we're hosting in Washington, D.C., and it's addressing the full spectrum of sexual exploitation. So there will be researchers talking about pornography, sex trafficking, child abuse, sexual violence, um, all, all of these different things. We do have group rates. We have student discounts. So definitely come and join us. We can hang out there. Um, so come and hang out with me in Washington, D.C. in April. So this is a very depressing subject. It's heavy information, but there are really tangible things that we can do as individuals. And I think even just talking to your friends about it, raising awareness is also itself something that's so important. And the more people that we, that we touch with this information, the, the better. So thank you so much for coming out here. And I think we'll open up for some Q&A. But thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we also have with us uh, uh, Shannon. Would you share a little bit about in this area? Uh, the, you're aware of this problem here, Fargo, and around us. Is there anything you can add to this conversation? Oh, you can stand up yes. here if you want. Or... Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. no. <laughs> I'm Shanna. I work at Raven Abuse Crisis Center. Um, I'm in a adult case manager. Four. Oh, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, human trafficking survivors. Um, we also work a lot with YWCA and youth works. Um, as a team, we all kind of fit in different ways. So I'm here kind of for like the local aspect of anyone's interested in that. So um, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. I got here a little late, so maybe I missed it, but uh, what about criminal justice? Uh, so, for example, this back page, page, don't they ever do sting operations and catch these people? Uh, that's a way of catching them, actually. Yeah, there, there definitely have been a lot of sting operations where they've used back page, but the amount of um, criminal of resources that it takes to pull off a sting like that, you know, for every one person that they're able to save that way, 100, 200, 300 more people are being bought and sold that are being missed. So that is, that is something that's definitely happened. But we think that it's actually really important to take down you know, this virtual slavery auction that we have going on instead of just trying to catch you know, one, one person downstream when we could go upstream and try to make it more difficult for sex traffickers to do their job. They have done some local. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. They what? They have done some local stings as well. Oh, I'm aware of the, yeah. the Fargo yeah. stings, yeah. I, yeah. You know, because really, I mean, prostitution has always been around, and so it, they're using that pay while they move somewhere else or something else will happen. But uh, one thing that I'm wondering about is that if they're under 18 years of age, those people should be locked up for a long time, and there should be a trail to the head guy and all that stuff. Is that is that really happening? I mean, is there no? Yeah. So stop? under under federal law, anyone who is under eighteen is a sex trafficking victim. Yeah. Um, which unfortunately, I think I actually just saw this today. I believe that there are still twenty seven states that don't rec that in their state law they would still arrest someone who's under 18 for prostitution instead of giving them into direct services. I don't know if you know North Dakota's stance on that. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> you have good stuff to say, would you? Yeah, so, those, I'm sorry about the microphone situation. Um, it's generally called safe harbor laws. So in North Dakota in 2015, we just passed that. So if you think just a few years ago, um, if there was a minor who was a victim of sex trafficking, they could have been prosecuted um, as a teenage prostitute. But since we have passed those laws, they are now treated um, as a victim and they would get um, uh, sent to work with Megan from Youth Works. She is kind of like me, but on the youth side. Um, yeah, I was gonna say something else, but. Oh, and also with the charges for um, the things that they've done locally, um, they're so, uh, almost a slap on the wrist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially for men, you know, for the adult things, like, unfortunately, um, I work with the adults, so of course my heart is with the adults, um, but the highest charges are for the minors, and even then, um, you know, you can see that. Sometimes they get lower charges. That's, that's the, you're talking about the customers? Yes. Yeah. No, but then there's there's the pimp, the guy that's in charge. What about them? Are they getting cleared out? I, that's what I don't see. I, where is that? Yeah, there have been. This is this could be a very long conversation. <laughs> um, and this is kind of the thing with sex trafficking is that uh, there's so much mind games and manipulation uh, that you can be really bonded with your trafficker or your pimp. Um, and so, like, if you're coming from a bad situation, where I'll see a lot with my clients is that. There's a lot of history of trauma and abuse, you know, from when they were younger. So if you come from this environment and this is what you know, and you have this person who's saying, "I love you, I'll take care of you," and then they do that, they might hit you sometimes, or you might have, you know, a Romeo pimp who's nicer, but of course still making you do X, Y, and Z with these other people. But you're still getting food um, and have a roof over your head where you may have not may have not been doing that before. It's really hard to speak with law enforcement when um, you may have had bad interactions with law enforcement before. A lot of my clients have um, substance use issues or um, a criminal record where you know they don't necessarily trust law enforcement. So we're, we're working really hard to remedy that, but it's hard to you know just hey believe me. <laughs> just one more follow-up question. So what you're saying is. Most of the prostitution that involve a member of the opposite sex or the same sex, whoever the partner is, uh, that's usually a, just a, a partnership. And uh, and then the ones that have actually a corral of them or bringing them in for other states or 
or from overseas, that's a lot more rare, or or is that common too? Did you want to say something? Oh, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie works up a lot of BCA, so I would work with her a lot. So I think what you'll find is that they do have what they call stables of women. Um, however, a lot of times they'll all kind of be like the wives of this person, so it's not just really that you'll see, um, you know, a pimp with multiple um, women that he's trafficking, but. Um, I mean, you do have situations where it's a boyfriend trafficking his girlfriend. We've definitely seen that, but you do a lot of times see where they'll develop these trauma bonds with multiple women. So um, Shanna was referring to trauma bonds, and so with the trauma bond, it can get it can be really hard to convince a person to testify against their trafficker. They're also afraid of the potential consequences. The traffickers have connections in the community. You know, the the trafficker has brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts who may know the, the victim and may try to retaliate against the victim for testifying against them. Um, these traffickers are also really bold and very brash, and so they'll do some really uh, awful things in response to um, any any time a, a victim disobeys them or something like that. So there's a lot of fear there, too, um, for retaliation from the trafficker himself. So, um, Here and then David. That's okay, David. Over. Oh, go ahead. Please, well, first. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm also from the Rape Women's Crisis Center. <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, you were talking a little bit about, like, kind of what I would consider, like, primary prevention, like when you got built in hotels to take off pay per view. And um, in 2009, we had an It's an Everybody's Business Summit, the Rape Women's Crisis Center ho um, hosted that at the Ramada, and we we brought in Chuck, it's Chuck Derry, I think, but he, he's a kind of a speaker and motor facilitator in the cities. But one thing that he did, he worked for the um, state, I think it was the Minnesota Bureau of Investigations or something like that. But he, he did something um, with law enforcement and one primary prevention step that they took was every year in Hudson, Wisconsin, they had their um, large uh, law enforcement conventions and they used this one particular hotel. And all of the law enforcement agencies in Minnesota um, made a policy within their company that they would not rent rooms or host a convention in which pornography, um, in which pay-per-view was an option for, for their police officers as they had stayed at the hotel as they had their convention. And so they called up this hotel and said, you know, we've always done business with you for years, but we're not, gonna, we're not hosting that this year because of our new policies. And of course, the, the hotel quickly got rid of pay per view. So I, I know that it seems like a um, like a monumental task, you know. But if you think about it really individual, uh, individualized from maybe a standpoint of what you could do is talking to your company and like making sure that you know you guys aren't holding conventions, or if there's the National Long Term Care Convention, like the nursing home, you know, whatever that is, just making sure that that kind of thing happens in an environment. And, and then Fight the New Drug is yes. like a really cool organization that I follow online and they talk a lot about the new drug of pornography and what that's doing, so. It seems like you all are aware of who the perpetrators are of, of the human trafficking and I'm wondering if the police are aware Aware as you all are, or do they know the pimps, who the pimps are, and if so, can they not just arrest them, or you know, is it? Am I being naive and thinking that um, you know it's just that simple? You have to have proof, most of all, and so in order to get proof, I can project. I can see your face. In order to prove it, in some ways, you have to have someone testify because. After the sexual act, if the person doesn't go get a rape kit done or something like that, you have no evidence. Unless you have a video in some way where someone's clearly not shown consent and where someone's forced into something. Uh, there was a trafficker in this area that they, um, he was pretty bold on his Facebook. He had images of himself with a woman who was on the leash, um, like large stacks of bills, and so they were able to use that as a way to kind of track him. Um, yeah, so. They're not always the brightest in certain ways in their boldness. Um, 
but it, it, it can be really hard to, it's because you need that testimony most of all from the, the survivors. Right, and with adults you need to prove force, fraud, or coercion, which can be hard to do if you have those trauma bonds. I didn't know if you wanted to have, I don't need to have No, you guys got it, that's good. Any other questions? Yes. One back and then Ricky. Getting a workout in today. <laughs> What's the youngest uh, person that's been trafficked in this area that you've seen? Um, I think with us it was age Science is already backing up the reality. Uh, there have, since 2011, there have been 30 neurological studies that show that pornography has negative and de detrimental impacts on the brain, but also that the, that supports the existence of pornography addiction. There have been over 40 peer-reviewed research studies on it as well. A lot of the times in the media, we see that journalists who are ever covering something about the harms of pornography they want to be even-handed, so they go over and they find the pro-pornography research as well. And these are the very honest journalists. Some journalists just like to cover the pro-pornography research because it's more fun to be pro-something um, than to talk about the harms of something. But when you actually just look at the body of research that there is, a body of quality research, it's not even a competition. Um, the most of the pro-pornography research is incredibly flawed in its methodology. They ask survey questions that are very tilted in order to get certain answers. Um, but 
Your Brain on Porn is a really good website for someone who wants to get into the intricacies of the brain research on pornography, Your Brain on Porn, and it's a completely secular organization. Um, there's also this organization called nofap.com, if you guys haven't heard of it, probably a lot of you have. It's a website for pornography recovery, and it has one to two million users on it every month, and 70 to 80 percent of the people who, of the guys who are on it are, identify themselves as atheist or agnostic. So this is not a religious issue. These are people who saw that pornography was having a detrimental impact on their lives and wanted to recover. So, um, so there is so much research. Your Brain on Porn is a great, um, great resource. Yeah. Why isn't it identified as an addiction? Um, a lot of the times people will say, oh, why isn't it, why isn't in it the, there's the DSM, which I'm blanking on the official long, five, yeah, the, which like lists all of the formally recognized addictions. And it's just a really long process to get into that. They still don't recognize, I believe they still don't recognize internet addiction as a thing, video game addiction as a thing. I know someone who literally spent 14 hours a day playing video games, lost his job, dropped out of college, but it's just not in the book yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't real. Just mm -hmm. a little bit. I'm a licensed counselor here in North Dakota, and I've been, for those of us who build insurance, you must use the DSM for the codes, you know, and there's a little bit of other important things in there. But generally, they have people, interest groups lobby when they're putting together the new book. Like we just went from DSM-4 to DSM-5, they have people lobbying to keep things out, <laughs> and they have lobbying to put things in, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. It's really weird, but uh, personally, I don't use it unless I have to. You know, there's other better materials that would give me definitions than, than it, but it's the standard. Yeah. Anyway. Any other questions? So. Last semester, um, I took a like a psychology of a sexual philosophy or some, something along. I don't know. It's kind of a it's kind of a long title, but um, I was talking to the professor, and you know this this thing kept coming up with uh, mostly like with pornography or sexual like prostitution. Most of the people who the Johns um, are just generally just regular people, right? So I just started thinking to myself, right? If, if most of these people, regular people, especially pornography usage, right? What is it that these people are not getting that's driving them, specifically in this case, pornography, right? Because if, if pornography is causing problems with sex trafficking, then what is what is the cause of watching the pornography? What what need is there? And I don't she. It's kind of hard to put it in a way that you know that sounds like okay. Well, these people, especially if you're talking about prostitution, like you don't want to be like, oh, well, the Johns are like, they're the ones who are having problems because that's obviously not true because the big, you know, the people who are especially in sex trafficking, you know, those are the victims. But, but, anyway, my my point being is that is there any research being done to say like what is causing is is this just these guys are just not getting any? Is this just like the natural biological compulsion? Is there a way to fix that that doesn't involve pornography, et cetera? You know, are we looking at people who are in stable relationships who aren't looking at pornography? What do they have that these other people don't? Is there a way to provide that? That's it's kind of yeah. a reverse way of looking at it. Anyway, so. These are great questions. We could honestly have like an hour presentation just talking about that. Um, I think one, so I won't be able to answer it in full, I think one problem is that most guys see it when they're very young, is the first time that they're exposed to it. Then it's normalized, and even if they maybe wait a, f a few years after seeing it when they're age eight or 13, um, 
it's, it's normalized to them. So a lot of the times, like I said, you know, what's even really their choice? They're exposed to it at such a young age. They're not consenting adults who are, you know, like with smoking, we recognize, okay, maybe someone wants to engage in this, but at least they know that it's harmful to them. People are getting hooked on it before they know it's even harmful. Um, unfortunately, we see in a lot of research that people who are in relationships are not then immune from pornography. People who are, have, have a sexual partner are not then satisfied with a sexual partner because pornography is a completely alien thing to act, an actual sexual experience with another person where there's mutuality, there's interaction, there's boundaries. With pornography, you can click between, you know, a thousand different women and and just, you know, have such an instant experience that it's com almost, it's so foreign compared to what an actual sexual experience is. And so we see that in, in, in so much research that pornography is linked to decreased satisfaction in relationships, increased rates of divorce, increased rates of domestic violence, um, particularly if the person is also drinking alcohol and watching pornography, rates of domestic violence, uh, rates of sexual domestic violence. Um, go up by a factor of two. Um, so, unfortunately, relationships, uh, while a lot of people who are rebooting or recovering from pornography can have a really great relationship that is a, helps them hold accountable, like any other addiction, a relationship can be really helpful, but it's not the fix-it solution, um, which is depressing. Why well, we have so many sex offenders in our jails and prisons is because of, of all this. Because back in '09, I can't remember what year was that that girl was killed by a sex predator, and it was all over the internet, it was all over the news. Um, Rodriguez killed she was shooting, and he got out of prison and he went around and killed her. So I'm wondering, is all of this is did his childhood? I'm wondering of all these sex offenders. We have so many of them because I don't know. I was I'm not going to say too much about me, but I've been around the block um, many times. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering: Is that why we have all these sex offenders? Because of all this trafficking? Because they know that they can get away with it and they get out and they do it again. That's my question. Is what is this why we have the sex offenders like we do? Um, I think it's definitely part of the equation. I think it's definitely part of the equation. There's a great researcher, Melissa Farley, um, who does a lot of research on the issue of prostitution specifically, and she said that every person that she's ever interviewed who has bought sex, and she's also interviewed sex offenders as well who've just been um, sexually violent towards another person, that everyone that she's ever interviewed has also watched pornography. So that's not to say that everyone who watches pornography will, but that pretty much everyone who's doing these kinds of sexual offenses has some experience with pornography. Mm. What is uh, the, I guess, the, the rehabilitation process like for those who would be described as addicted to, to something like pornography? Um, kind of what are, what are some of the methods or tools, what are available available to help with that and um, I mean I guess with, with any addiction I suppose it's always something that that person will struggle with probably for the rest of their life um, but at kind of what point are they able to readjust normally to a relationship again? I think the question of at what point do they kind of readjust to their normal sexual templates, their normal relational, relational templates, it's really an individual question. It probably, and it is really tied to how long they've been watching pornography. The longer they've been watching it, the longer it takes for most. Um, for general tactics, typically it includes having an accountability partner, um, not allowing yourself to have electronics when you're in a room alone, um, and, and usually just checking in with people every day. There's a lot of great material out there. So there's Covenant Eyes, which is an accountability platform. So it will send someone reports on um, if you've been looking at like all okay websites, if you've been looking at some questionable or some um, 
pornographic websites. So that's a great accountability resource. And then nofap.com has really great resources also for um, just accountability and community. But typically it's just really just staying away from being alone with your computer, recognizing what your triggers are. Some people go to pornography if they're bored, if they're lonely, if they're sad, if they're procrastinating. Recognizing what those are um, and trying to form better habits to respond to those triggers. But it is, it's a high relapse addiction, very high relapse addiction. Because internet pornography, it's available, it's anonymous, it's much easier to get than it is even to get alcohol or let alone drugs, so. Yes, yeah, and there's the biological drive that's, which is one reason why pornography addiction is even, is so dangerous because it really taps into something that is a natural biological drive, but then it wires your sexuality to pixels on a screen instead of real people, so. It's obvious like I'm a hunter, a dirt issue, or somebody else would say, okay, you have to stop doing this. Um, it's more of a, I'm choosing to do something about this. Yeah, it usually has to be a very personal decision. Even though th this goes into things that I haven't discussed today, but there are so many negative effects of pornography. There's an increased number of young men are experiencing um, pornography-induced erectile dysfunction because they've wired their, what they're aroused by so much to pornography that they can be aroused with pornography but not with a real person. So sometimes we're seeing men having those experiences or they may be able to be aroused with a real person but they have to picture pornography in their head while they're having sex with a person. So sometimes there are actual physical um, manifestations that then make people say, whoa, I need to look at what, why this is happening for me. Um, but yeah, usually it has to be something kind of internal. Mm -hmm. Um, you had mentioned that it's like, uh, it starts really young with a lot of people with, uh, pornography addictions. Are there any sort of laws that, um, prevent, uh, youth from watching pornography? Uh, if so, what are they? And if not, what ways could that be implemented? Great question. There are not laws um, about that, but there's a strange law called federal obscenity law because obscenity, which is the legal term for hardcore pornography, it's actually illegal to, dis to commercially distribute it via hotel, motel, retail stores, common carrier, and the internet. So like Pornhub is actually illegal, what they're doing, because they're distributing obscenity through the internet. But these laws haven't been enforced for like 10 years, which is really bad timing, because that's how long the internet has been a thing. So. So, that, so that's one law, um, and th there is a page on our website where we talk more about that and ways that you can contact the Department of Justice and asking them to enforce the law if that's something that you want. Um, but really, it, it, a lot of it comes down to maybe parents knowing more about this to help protect their children, and not only to put filters on, but also to talk about their kids, because even if you have the best filters, your kid will be exposed to it, most likely still at a young age. So we need to talk to our kids about pornography so that when they see it, they understand that it's okay if they're curious, but that they need to turn it, turn it off, come and tell a parent, have a conversation. Uh, this is just a comment on what you said. And I know that in South Korea, there's some, I don't know if it's some or all pornographic websites require a real Korean social security number. And they actually use their Korean social security number for a lot of things at even at a young age, so like access to video games. Very hard to play South Korean video games. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, um, because uh, you know, pretty much everything is going to require a Korean social security and there was actually an incident where the president's Korean social security number got hacked, and then that's how people were accessing pornographic websites. But that, <laughs> not necessarily advocating that we all need to be able to use our social security number to log into the website or, or anything, whatever it is, you know, to make sure we're like 13 or have parents' permission to play like RuneScape, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, I don't know. That, 
and um, similar, similarly, in the UK, they just passed a law um, so that internet service providers actually have to automatically filter pornography out. It's called the opt-in model. So automatically, all of the internet is going to be filtered. And if you want pornography, you have to take an extra step to get it, rather than right now, where we're all automatically opted into pornography and you have to take extra steps to try to keep it out. Um, so that's been passed. Um, they're still in the implementation process, so it hasn't gone in yet. It'll be really interesting to see how that goes. I think that that's a really great model. In America, we can't legislate that because of our First Amendment laws. Um, but if an internet service provider company wanted to just decide to do that as a private enterprise, they would have the right to do that. Browsers could do that. Yeah, browsers could do that. Like Google could do that. Verizon could do that. Comcast could do that. So those are other things that, if you go to dirtydozenlist.com, and if you want to email the CEO of Comcast, you could edit the email and add in. And also, actually, I think in our, in our form email, we say, also, consider <laughs> uh, having the opt-in model, because that really helps. I, I suspect that it will help young children to not be exposed. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So it seems uh, like on a place such as a college campus that porn is a very normalized thing. Uh, and the idea that it might be linked to other uh, terrible things that are happening in the world, like sexual exploitation or trafficking, um, is not a very welcome idea uh, specifically to young adults on college campuses who find absolutely nothing wrong with it and probably enjoy it frequently or not frequently, whatever. Um, so what do you think are some effective ways to have larger scale conversations uh, about topics like this to let people know like, the harms of it um, rather than having people kind of just not care about it. Yeah. That's the million dollar question. If you, if you come up with the perfect formula, let me know, because um, I would love to know it. I think that one, one thing is really just to talk about it, whether you're having these presentations or um, talking about it with friends. I mean, honestly, most people do see that as having some kind of negative effect on them. Maybe not everyone, but a lot of people do. A lot of people in relationships see that as having a really negative effect on their relationship. Um, and another thing, too, is just to really share the fact that there is so much research about the harms. I just scratched the surface on the research that there is. There's more at endsexualexploitation.org slash public health. I wish I had put that up there. Slash public health. We have just full research summaries, 50 pages of highly vetted research that shows the way that it's impacting body image, sexual violence, erectile dysfunction, all of these different things. And so when you start to look at the research, I think it helps people say, OK, I'm not talking about this from a moral perspective. I'm talking about this from a public health perspective, the same way that we had to talk about smoking. You know, in the 1950s, smoking was so normal. Everyone did it. Doctors said that it was healthy. But then as more research started coming out, people started talking about it and they recognized the harms. And so that's really what I'm advocating for with pornography, that we need to be conscious consumers and know actually what's out there and, and be aware of the harms. So I think slash public health and sexual exploitation at org. Did you have something? I'm trying to be careful with the mic now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, um, before I started doing this work more specifically, um, I always thought like, oh, I, I sometimes say the P word because I don't like the word prostitution um, because that kind of implies that there's a choice. And before I, I was more biased where I thought like, oh, people choose to engage in prostitution way more than you think. Like, yes, there's people who are sex trafficked, um, but it's you know, not as much, there's way more. Um, so the stat that I learned that kind of slapped me in the face was that the average age of entry is 12 to 14, 15 years old into the life. Um, and then when you consider past trauma um, and things like that, it's just really like, you know, if that helps. Yeah. And um, 
the researcher Melissa Farley surveyed several hundred women um, who are in prostitution and 93% of them said that they wanted to leave and that they just didn't think that they had any other option. So what, is, that a, is that a true choice? I would definitely argue not. But. Thank you all so much for coming. I'll stick around if you have any other questions. Um, and I don't know, Pastor Darrell, if you have any other final, final parting words. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Katie referenced a few times uh, Covenant Eyes, which is a filtering software and accountability software. It's a great company, great. It works perfect on all platforms. Uh, there's mm -hmm. some uh, papers back here that explain what that is, and so that's one way to protect protect yourself, protect others. Also, some of you know me. I'm the guy over there that gives away books. <laughs> I have a couple of books that I think these are great resources. Every man's battle. And the other one here is every young man's battle. And so this is a, you know, I think most of you know how to contact me, so if you'd like one of these books to give to somebody or for yourself or whatever, just contact me, we'll give you one. So again, thank you, Haley, for being here. And I just want to close with a quick prayer. Father, thank you for the dignity that you've blessed each of us with, and we've talked about uh, some of the challenges in our culture that, that are affronts to that dignity, and I just pray that you'll bless each of us, Lord, to help uh, fight uh, any kind of abuse like this. Lord, help us uh, not to participate and to help others to see the danger. Our prayer in Jesus' name.